Hello, my name is Tommy Piggott. Welcome to the Republican Rundown. To start things off, we wanted to say congratulations to Madison on the birth of her baby, Michalina. We couldn't be more excited about it. Congratulations, uh, Madison. Congratulations. Marcus, we're very excited for you. Uh, very excited to have another member of the RNC family. Uh, so, you know, she'll be probably, hopefully, off for a few weeks while she's trying to, uh, uh, you know, manage a growing family. But we'll see her soon, and I'm sure she's eager to get back, and uh, we can't wait to have her back. We are just so excited for both of them. Yeah, it was such amazing news. So, so exciting. And, uh, and less important news, or maybe secondary news, New Hampshire primary was on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, so leading to the New Hampshire primary, just wanted to play the comments from our chair first, just so everyone watching at home could see what she had to say in reaction to the results. How do you look at tonight, and what's the RNC's take? Well, one thing I will say about the whole field of candidates that have run for president on our side, I commend them. They've been great. This has been a great contest. But I think there's some history that was made tonight. We have never had a nominee in our party that has uh, won without winning both with uh, winning either Iowa or New Hampshire. Donald Trump is the first ever to win both. Uh, I'm looking at the math and the path going forward, and I don't see it for Nikki Haley. I think she's run a great campaign. But I do think there is a message that's coming out from the voters, which is very clear. We need to unite around our eventual nominee, which is going to be Donald Trump. And we need to make sure we beat Joe Biden. It is 10 months away till the November election. And we can't wait any longer to put our foot on the gas, to beat the worst president, to beat a president that's kept our borders open, allowed fentanyl to pour through, allowed inflation to, to go rampant. He is hurting the American people, and we need to do everything we can to unite so that we can defeat him. So a lot of takeaways from the primaries. I thought one of the big ones, and our chair was mentioning the issues there, the border and the economy were the two biggest issues, both in Iowa and New Hampshire. I mean, Keith, when you look at the border and the economy, what do you think voters are saying when they talk about those being the most important issues? Yeah, I mean, I think people are saying, you know, we've seen uh, over the last, what, four years, three years, that they are sick of the uh, chaos down at the southern border. I mean, I feel like we get on this show every week and we talk about, uh, you know, a new tragedy or new um, numbers or just more and more evidence every week about how just out of control the, uh, the uh, crisis is. And then on the economy, people are, you know, they're still feeling it. And that continues to be a, what we see in data, both public and what we hear when we're out in the field. I was just in New Hampshire this week as well. Uh, that's people, it's top of mind. And so, uh, you know, we know that folks are um, tired of Biden, tired of this administration. Um, but the chair's right about, you know, unity is, is going to be so important if we're going to win. We have to stay united uh, and we're going to have to all, uh, you know, work together and, you know, put whatever differences we have aside and do everything we can to defeat this president because there's just so much at stake. Yeah, it's, it's, and I think unifying as well that this is affecting everybody, the economy, the border. It's not just affecting one group of people. It's literally everybody in this country is feeling pain from Biden's policies. That's right. And I think that's why we saw such historic turnout in New Hampshire, right, is because uh, Republican voters and all voters see that, um, you know, any of the candidates that we've had on the stage all along and any of the candidates that were competing in New Hampshire would be a better president than this president. Right. Um, you know, I always have a soft spot for New Hampshire. It was the origin, I believe, of the dog face pony soldier comment, which is um, one of my favorites. Oh, yeah, exactly. So um, it's one of my favorites. But I think, you know, starting then and, and then to now, every state is a border state under Biden. Every state is a experiencing this historic inflation that this pre president is responsible for. And that's why we're seeing um, such a historic response in states like New Hampshire. Yeah, I mean, in New Hampshire, you know, it feels, you know, those effects of the border crisis um, that more and more are talking about, but they have felt it for quite some time when it comes to fentanyl and the opioid epidemic. And so uh, it truly is, uh, I think, amazing that we set a turnout record. Uh, again, we beat the 2016 record this last uh, week. And I think it really shows that we have the enthusiasm uh, and that we have the win in our sails. Uh, and we just got to keep it going because we know Joe Biden doesn't care about New Hampshire. I mean, he, he changed everything to make sure that uh, they had less of an impact in this primary. 
Uh, and, you know, that's why he wasn't even on the ballot. They had to write him in if they wanted to vote for him. Uh, he, you know, meanwhile, Republicans have shown up. We continue to show up. We're talking about the issues that they care about. And, you know, it showed in the numbers uh, when, uh, of how many people participated in our primary um, that, you know, we, uh, we have the wind at our backs. We just got to keep moving. Yeah, in 1988, Joe Biden drops out before New Hampshire. 2008, he drops out before New Hampshire. 2020, he comes in fifth in New Hampshire, and now he's decided, you know what, not yeah. going to compete at all in New Hampshire. Right. I mean, it couldn't be more clear that he doesn't care about New Hampshire at all. Exactly. And I think even in 2020, he, I remember he actually dicked and went to South Carolina before the primary was even over, right? So yeah, this is a president who doesn't care about states that aren't on the beltway, um, and we're seeing the results of that across the country. Yeah, and it also shows how weak he is as a president, I think, Joe Biden, because, you know, uh, they have to completely change their primary schedule to make sure that he's elected. I mean, they have to defend him in every single way. And it's not just the primary schedule. It's using the short stairs on the airplane. It's rushing the stage so it doesn't get lost after events. It's the whole entire campaign is based off of hiding and protecting Joe Biden, which is not what I would think any American wants in a president. No, no. And I think it's funny, uh, Anna, bringing up that he doesn't care about states outside of the beltway. What was he doing during New Hampshire? He was doing a rally in Northern Virginia. I mean, it's just this president is so out of touch and so absent and does not uh, seem to want to go to the places that um, that where folks are really being affected by the, his failures. Uh, he would rather uh, just kind of cross the river. And, and that's where he decided to spend, uh, you know, the, the New Hampshire primary day. It's just crazy to me. You know, the only trips he takes are day trips unless he can go to a millionaire or billionaire's vacation home. I mean, that's it for yeah. Joe Biden. You know, it's a, and uh, that, that rally, by the way, complete disaster, protests all over the place. And I thought it was interesting. The media doesn't seem to carry any of Biden's comments anymore. Have you ever noticed MS, uh, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, they don't show them live. No. A and if you want to get them live, you got to go follow RNC research. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, that's those are the get, highlights. That's yeah. where they typically get on earth. And, and I'm thinking if I was MSNBC, I also wouldn't show them live. I almost wish that they would because all of his events are complete disasters. You cannot watch Joe Biden for more than five seconds and think that man deserves four more years in the White House. Right. I mean, that's why they're bunkering him down in the basement, right? They're, we're seeing him do less and less public events. And when he does, it's an extremely scripted, extremely uh, well-managed uh, speech that involves really just as little off-the-cuff interaction with people as possible, right? And when he's not doing that, he's probably jetting off on vacation or, like you said, at some billion's home, billionaire's home. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what we're going to see more and more as the cycle continues to ramp up. They're going to continue to put him in the basement and uh, really minimize his interactions with voters, which is really a shame because I think voters deserve to hear answers from this president and all of his failures. Yeah, I mean, if it's funny. Uh, you know, CNN, their ratings are so poorly, it probably would behoove them to carry the president's uh, speeches live because it would actually provide, you know, reasons to watch because you never know what's going to happen with this president every five minutes, like you just said. Yeah. But, you know, they they obviously clearly have an agenda. We so we talked last week about how, the, you know, these, these folks didn't want to carry um, the former President Trump's uh, speeches live. Uh, they truly don't know how to handle this right now. They know that their candidate is is, you know, sinking by the day. Uh, and they know that Republicans have the enthusiasm. And I think we're going to see uh, a very interesting media landscape this year. Yeah, I mean, and it's interesting you brought up the off-the-cuff remarks. Mm -hmm. Part of what – so the speeches are a disaster. We've all seen them be a disaster. So what the campaign has done recently – I mean, they, they're publicizing this. They're, they're saying, we're doing less speeches. Instead, we're going to go off-the-cuff and talk with voters at businesses and, and libraries. And the most recent one, which he did during the Iowa caucus weekend, was a disaster. It was a complete disaster. So instead, what they do next is they go back to speeches. Yeah. Yeah. They go back to speeches, a big planned rally, and it's a complete disaster. He's interrupted every five minutes by protests, and they literally have to swarm the stage afterwards to keep him from getting lost. To your point about a media landscape, I mean, it's, it's, they, they can't figure out how to present Joe Biden in a good light because he keeps on messing up all the time. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, they and the campaign clearly knows they're in trouble. I mean, just this week they announced that they're dispatching top aides from the White House, including his 2020 uh, campaign manager, back to the campaign. Uh, we have this president on the ropes. It just now is going to take us, again, unifying and working together, getting out, you know, signing folks up to bank their vote, you know, during the GOTV uh, time, you know, knocking on those doors, making those phone calls. It's going to take a lot of hard work because at the end of the day, you know, he still is an incumbent president. And, you know, it, it, it's not a foregone conclusion despite his numbers. We have to put in the work. Um, but we can do this because clearly that campaign knows um, that they are in some serious trouble. 
and it, we just got to make sure that we all stick together and do what needs to be done to bring this home in November. Right. And if the media won't carry that, too, I think it's really incumbent upon, you know, the Republican supporters watching, right, to visit GOP.com, uh, sign up to make phone calls, sign up to phone bank and uh, knock doors, right? Because if the mainstream media isn't going to get that message out and bring awareness of Biden's failures, then it's really incumbent upon us as Republicans and, and folks engaged in the process to do that. Yeah, if the Hunter Biden laptop has taught us anything about how the media is going to approach scandals involving Joe Biden, it is incumbent upon us to be united on that. That's factcheckbiden.com, at RNC Research. All these different tools that we're putting together uh, are so incredibly important. Going back to the most important issues that were in Iowa and New Hampshire, I mean, Biden's approach to both the border and the economy are that my plan is working. And in my mind, there couldn't be a bigger disconnect between saying my, my, my plan is working and the fact that those are the two biggest concerns of voters. That to me seems like a massive gap that Biden can't bridge. Yeah, I mean, it's entirely tone deaf when you have kind of like we were talking earlier. Every state is a border state under Joe Biden because uh, states like New Hampshire and across the country are experiencing this historic fentanyl crisis when Joe Biden campaigned on eliminating the opioid crisis, right? Um, every state is experiencing problems at the grocery store. So when you have a president saying, oh, my plan is working, um, when every single day voters are going to the gas pump, going to the grocery store, um, you know, seeing the impact of these policies in their communities and feeling the exact opposite, it's an entire disconnect. So uh, I guess it's no wonder that they continue to, you know, micromanage and, and keep him away from voters as much as possible because, um, you know, they don't have an answer or, or actual message for those issues. Yeah, I mean, the fact he's saying that the, my plan is working is specifically on the border. I mean, this is one of the things that is so insulting to people. If his plan is working, then the only conclusion is that this crisis is intentional. I mean, that's one of the primary options here. Mm -hmm. And so how is that a platform to run on? I purposely created this crisis and my plan is working. That seems like a terrible campaign message at the very least, if not extremely concerning for our country, an example why he needs to lose. Uh, on the economy specifically, I think one of the things that people forget or the left would like us to forget is that he was warned that spending all of that money would lead to inflation. And not by just you know the RNC over here who mm. doesn't like wasting money anyway, by liberal economists. So for him to go out there and say, I'm not responsible or I'm making progress, I mean, that's insult to injury in my mind. Right, and I think one thing people forget too is especially when you get back to, uh, I know it's hard because it all blends together at this point, but so many of the spending debates we've had over the last two years, I mean, Biden wanted to spend more money. I mean, imagine if we didn't have this Republican House majority passing, um, instead of the wasteful spending bills that Biden wanted to pass, passing things like the Lower Energy Cost Act, passing things like the Rain and Inflation Act. It would be great if people like Chuck Schumer and Biden would take that up to actually address some of these concerns that Americans are facing, but this could actually be so much worse, which is hard to imagine, but it's it's the truth. Yeah, I mean, it's and completely disavowing all responsibility, saying my plan is working, ignoring all warnings. I, it would be surprising if it wasn't Joe Biden to a T. I mean, he did this in the Senate all the time. Uh, he, did, he completely uh, does not accept any responsibility at all. I mean, it's the same with the border, where he's saying, I have a border security plan, and I put it on day one. His border security plan was to open the borders. I mean, it's good. I don't even know if you can call it that. I mean, that's what his plan was. And House Republicans have a bill for 250 days plus saying, secure the border, and he's refusing to pass it. Yeah, I mean, I think time and time again how fortunate we are uh, that we do have this House majority. I mean, really think about what Speaker Pelosi would do right now. Uh, and, you know, I think we're going to see a lot more of these debates over the next few months. You know, there's going to be another deadline to keep the government open. The Democrats seem, uh, you know, hell-bent on ensuring that uh, there aren't more cuts and that, you know, that we don't take this border, uh, you know, that, that we don't address this border uh, properly. And, you know, we're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be incumbent upon us to make sure that we are, you know, providing the backup for our House Republicans because they truly are holding the line here. And we, sh we are internally grateful uh, that they are not allowing Democrats to make this problem, uh, you know, continue to skyrocket. And they are doing everything in their power to bring this down and, and try to keep this reined in. Yeah, and part of that is sending those reinforcements to in November, making sure that we strengthen our House majority, flip the Senate, win back the White House, because these executive orders, I mean, this is a point that Speaker Johnson makes all the time when it comes to the border. Obviously, legislation would make sure that we have laws in place that secure this border. We should pass it. But Joe Biden can reverse all of his policies with a pen. He could reverse his executive orders with the stroke of a pen. And I think the fact that he doesn't goes back to this point of, is it intentional? I mean, because he could solve this crisis tomorrow by himself because he created it. And so I don't know how he goes to voters and say, you know, here's my message. Here's what I'm doing when he created this crisis, could solve it by himself, and yet purposefully 
refuses to do so. That to me seems like a major red flag at the very least. Um, and then you have people like Corrine Jean-Pierre going on the podium every single day, continuing to gaslight Americans, um, echoing some of those same points that Biden does, that we fix this crisis, we've secured the border. I mean, I don't know what that says about what they think about American voters, but it's either delusional or intentional or um, either way, just an insult to the intelligence of the American people. Yeah, and, and the fact that the media is not asking more of these questions, like, and hold them more accountable, and that we have to do it shows the bias that we're up against. It also shows how important the RNC is in terms of getting these, this information out there. Like we said before, at RNC Research, factcheckbiden.com. It's, there's so many examples where we're doing that heavy lifting of fact checking Biden. But honestly, it's not that hard because he lies all the time. Like he literally lies all the time. It's not that hard to fact check him. You just have to, you know, look it up on the, <laughs> you know, it's just not really that hard. Uh, I think it's also the fact that he has this disconnect. It's why he's on vacation so much. And we live at RNC Research uh, pulling these stats. He has gone on vacation on a record amount, a record amount. And kind of a contrast to me, we talked about the border, but he still hasn't been to East Palestine, Ohio. We're, uh, what, nearing a year? Yeah. That happened. And so record amount of vacation yeah. hasn't gone to East Palestine, Ohio. And yet, yet again, another standard we didn't set for him in East Palestine. He said he would go. Yeah. He said he would go and he hasn't. Right. No. I mean, he just doesn't care. He just doesn't care. We, I mean, it's, it's so obvious that, you know, to him in 2020, he, you know, he had to be kept in the basement. It worked for him then. I do not think it's going to work for him this time. I mean, th at this point, he has been the president. He needs to answer the f to his failures, and he needs to, you know, he needs to go to Ohio and explain why it's taken him so long, if he even ever goes. He needs to go to Arizona uh, and talk about why, you know, the nearest beach they can go to, uh, they have to go through a port that was uh, shut down, the Lukeville port. Uh, I've gone through it many times. Uh, you go to Rocky Point, and it's a popular place for Phoenix uh, residents to go on vacation. It was shut down because of this border crisis was so bad. Uh, we're seeing that all over the place. And, you know, you look at Nevada, you know, their, their economy is, is fortunately, you know, in a, in a decent spot because of Governor Lombardo. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of anxiety there because, you know, that state, when the economy goes down, it feels it more than anywhere else. And so uh, this president... It thinks that he can just rehash the 2020 uh, playbook that he had, uh, but I don't think he's going to be able to get away with it this time. Uh, there's just, you know, at this point, the buck stops with him and the pain and the failures uh, that he's inflicted uh, have uh, just been so much that he's going to have to get out and explain himself. Yeah, and kind of a, explain himself on this issue, so many different issues, um, if only the media would ask him those questions. And also, when he ha is asked questions, he literally has a... Uh, a list presented to him of reporters that he is supposed to call, to call on that have presumably been vetted by his team, right? Presumably been vetted. Uh, he often says things like, I'm supposed to call on these people. As if, who's, who's telling him he's supposed to? I mean, this is, this is like where we are right now with this president. He is such in a bubble. Uh, he was talking to mayors the other day, and he was asked about lead pipes. And there was a photo taken of his binder, and the question was in the binder, and the answer was in the binder. That's not what the American people need to see. They actually need to hear from this president his thoughts on things. I mean, that, that's not what we need as a president. Yeah, I think a common joke that we all make around here and um, in Republican communication circles, right, is it must be the most glorious job to be a Democrat communication staffer, right? Because you kind of just uh, chirp out these talking points. The media just immediately picks them up. Um, it must be just the easiest job in the world. I remember um, a couple weeks back when the Biden campaign was hosting meetings with reporters, basically outlining spreadsheets on all of their coverage, telling them um, that they're wrong on all these issues, right? And so the media just picks it up, and you know that's just how it works for those communication staffers because the media is so um, you know willing to just chirp everything they say. Yeah, I would love to be able to give a performance review yeah. to, to the media. That sounds, <laughs> it must be real nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, performance review and also have the media print your press releases as if they're articles. I mean, that's right. like literally what's going on here when it comes to Biden's communications department. And what's astonishing is even despite all of that, his approval rating is still at, you know, what was the most recent one, 30 percent. I mean, it's like it's, it's sinking like a rock on all these different issues, even with that protection, because you can't deny reality, right? You can't like you can't deny the fact that costs are up. You can't deny the fact the border is open. You can't deny the fact that crime's up in many cities. You just can't deny it. And people know that he's to blame for this sort of stuff. So even when the media protecting him, the fact that it's still down shows how bad his policies are, but also shows to the point you're making earlier, why us uniting is so important, why us going to bankyourvote.com is so important. We talk about that every week as well because it is so important. I mean, the 50 states we have, I mean, Bank Your Vote probably is the most, if not one of the, like, the most or one of the most important things that people can do today 
yeah. to help us win November. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it will be the most important thing that, uh, you know, we in this office um, talk about, push, and promote. Uh, and it'll be the most important thing that Republican voters can do is to sign up to bank, uh, at bankyourvote.com, commit to voting early, and helping us uh, free up those resources to chase uh, those, those folks who uh, aren't sure who they want to vote for or aren't sure if they want to vote at all. So uh, it is going to be super critical. Uh, and of course, you know, we have a bunch of resources, like you said, factcheckbiden.com to, to help folks uh, make sure that they're getting out there and talking to their family and talking to everyone. Because, you know, we, we do this show once a week, but, uh, you know, the media's on. They got, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours a day where they can just uh, do the bidding of, of, of Joe Biden and Democrats uh, on the ballot. Uh, and it's going to take all of us talking to our friends, our family, our neighbors about what is going on and what folks can do about it. Uh, and so we encourage you to sign up to volunteer and, of course, go to bankyourvote.com. So like we said, for more information on this, on protecting the vote, banking your vote, they can go to bankyourvote.com, protectthevote.com, gop.com, lots of resources to get involved. It's important that we come together, beat, Bo beat Biden in November. We can't take four more years of Joe Biden. This has been the Republican Rundown. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week.